This is the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast from Advanta IRA, where we show you how to explore investments beyond Wall Street and open your eyes to new options for your portfolio. It's time to take control and give yourself the freedom to choose where you invest your money. Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. My name is Alex Perney, and today we're going to be doing kind of a follow-up to the last podcast we did that was <clears throat> mainly focused on discussing uh, exotic taxes such as UBIT and UDFI taxes when, when involved in investing with IRAs into certain types of different investments as they're normally centered around investing into certain types of private equities. So today we're going to be really discussing and getting into what exactly are private equities and how investors can utilize their IRA funds to invest in these. Most of the times when people look to invest with their IRAs, you're normally specifically looking at what is on a tradable securities market because most people are investing with some type of large wirehouse. But at least what we do here at Advanta IRA, as many of you know, this what this podcast is done as an adjunct to what we do here at Advanta IRA and self-directed IRAs, we have a lot of people that are interested in investing into private equities, or maybe are looking for some other additional alternatives. So I wanted to kind of cover that because it's very good to understand what exactly is a private equity. It's not simply just um, <clears throat> you know your startup companies. There is a large breadth of things that go uh, into the back end of what exactly makes up these types of investments. Also, the different types of structures they are, what types of people can qualify to invest in these, some potential issues, and also, again, how maybe they might work into some specific taxes that you might need to be aware of. So first and foremost, let's define what is a private equity. A private equity describes investment partnerships that buy and manage <clears throat> companies before selling them. This is mainly specific to private equity firms. Now, sometimes when people think about private equities, they're thinking more along the lines of what a private equity firm is, maybe a private hedge fund. That's not the case when it comes to investing in private equities. It's important to understand, again, kind of where these things delineate. And when people say private equities, what exactly does that mean? Just because someone says you're eating dinner doesn't necessarily mean exactly what you're eating. And again, that's kind of what I want to get to today with talking about what private equities are. So that's what a private equity fund is is. But more specifically, private equity involves investing into some type of entity. And normally these are structured as limited partnerships, but they can be many different other types of things, such as LLCs, trusts, <clears throat> uh, limited partnerships, of course, and uh, different types of corporations. But that is essentially what it's talking about when, in, when people talk about investing into what a private equity is. It's important to understand, again, the difference between a private equity firm and a private equity. <clears throat> now, these are typically almost always seen as alternative investments. Equities, meaning publicly traded stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, are what are going to typically be called as traditional investments or you know what people you know, just kind of think of when they're talking about normal investing, especially when it comes to retirements. So now that we understand exactly kind of, you know, what is a private equity, let's maybe talk about a few of the different types of private equities that are out there and what exactly it might mean and what investors can look for if maybe someone poses the opportunity to invest in one of these things and also specifically what it looks like to do it with an IRA as well. So the first and foremost, let's start off with an LLC. What is an LLC? An LLC stands for a limited liability company. It's a type of entity mainly focused on here in the United States, but there are other analogous types in other countries. We're not going to necessarily get into that today, but a limited liability company is a way to structure an entity or organization for tax and liability purposes in the United States that a lot of people often opt to use when it comes to starting a new business. <clears throat> now, with any new business comes the need for capital. A lot of times people inject their own capital into these businesses, but more often than not, you need to raise some outside capital in order to have a functioning business. So with an LLC, typically that's going to be seen as membership. You are a member of an LLC. That is what the shareholder of this type of entity is called. Now, there's many different parts of an LLC, and we'll kind of break that down here in a minute. But the important thing to understand is that if you are interested in investing into an LLC, uh, you are typically going to be investing in as a member. Now, there are some different types of ways to invest into LLCs, and we'll branch into that here in a minute. But when it comes to investing into an LLC, here's the few kind of key pieces of paperwork that an LLC needs to have in order to at least be in existence. First and foremost, 
an LLC needs to be registered with a particular state. In the United States, there's 50 different states that they can register in. So you could be a Nevada LLC, it could be a Florida LLC, it could be an Alaskan LLC or Hawaiian LLC. <clears throat> These all just refer to where the business is basically registered to do business. Now, that's not necessarily to say that they can't be operating in other states. There's plenty of different people that register an LLC, let's say in the state of Delaware. Now, this might be done for different reasons, such as corporate and anonymity, favorable tax status, but it shouldn't necessarily mean for someone to shy away from investing into a particular entity just because maybe it's registered in a certain state and doing business in another. Now, I need to do need to preface this while making a decision to invest in one entity versus another or any investment versus another, you need to make sure you're doing your own due diligence. Just because it may not necessarily be illegal for some LLC in a certain state to be doing business in another state, if you're going to be placing your hard-earned capital with a particular uh, investment, especially in the private equity realm, when there's not necessarily a governing body of oversight like the Security Exchange Commission or FINRA that is regulating these types of investments, you need to make sure that you understand why maybe an entity has decided or a business has decided to operate in one state and register in another. Again, it can be simple things, or it could be something that you need to take a little bit of a closer look at. <clears throat> but that is kind of the first and foremost thing, understanding that these types of entities are registered in a certain state. So if you say, hey, John, I'd like to invest in your project. I see that it's a Nevada LLC and we're sitting here in Florida, maybe asking the question of why they did that or just understanding that that is you know, something that a lot of people do is good to know. Now, some further downstream things that are also involved in setting up an LLC is that they have to have an art, they have to have their articles of organization, which is their registration. They have to have a tax ID number. So if someone says, hey, I have an LLC, maybe good to kind of gather some of these documents to make sure that you understand who is involved in this particular business. Now, the articles of organization are going to name who the... <clears throat> Uh, registered officer of that LLC is who the individual that's authorized to sign documents on behalf of that LLC is. Now, there could be multiple, but at least it gives you a good baseline of understanding who you're investing with when it comes to uh, smaller LLCs. Now, LLCs, again, can range in scale from maybe one or two people to hundreds, if not thousands of employees and many, many different officers. So when we're talking about this, I'm mainly kind of talking about more in the startup realm, people that are looking to acquire capital in the beginning, because the <clears throat> larger scale ones, it's kind of a whole other you know, animal, if you will, when it comes to investing with that, but at least maybe sh making sure that you get a copy of their articles of organization to understand that if you're talking to someone that's trying to maybe solicit, and, and I use the term solicit loosely, or to raise capital for something to at least make sure that, you know, if they're not, if they're saying that they're the owner or that they're the officer, maybe that they're listed on corporate filing documents or you have some other type of verification that shows, hey, this person is indeed who I think they are when it comes to relation to this uh, particular entity. So again, that would be listed on some type of corporate registration with a particular state. And normally those are going to be public documents. Now, different states have different levels of anonymity for how they allow people to shield themselves from public view when it comes to uh, LLCs. So do keep that in mind. Some states like Nevada, Wyoming, uh, Delaware do allow for that type of shielding, but making sure that you get some type of verification when it comes to the actual people you're investing with as to their relationship to the entity, definitely not a bad idea. Now, furthermore from that, and this is not a document that is typically publicly provided or something that you maybe necessarily will get <clears throat> uh, access to when it comes to looking at investing in one of these things is called an operating agreement. Now, an operating agreement isn't inherently a required document for a particular LLC to be in existence, but it is typically a good idea for people putting one putting entities together to have one. And especially if you're looking to invest, again, you're harder in capital and you would like to make sure that they are, you know, operating with good faith and, you know, again, uh, you know, protecting themselves. An operating agreement is what's going to detail uh, the shareholders of the entity. It's going to detail the uh, operations of the company, so operating agreement, and also any other type of ancillary things like governing law. 
you know, where lawsuits uh, are are going to be domiciled and, and a lot of other things are going to be detailed in that operating agreement. Now, I said that it's not typically publicly available, but when it comes to investing into an LLC, more often than not, there's going to be some type of procurement of this document to detail your investment. So again, LLCs typically have members or shareholders, and those are typically going to be listed on an operating agreement, not the articles registered with the state. That just states uh, who the officers are, who can sign documents in some capacity, and who the state can reach out to as far as the registered agent to provide notices uh, of any type of actions or other type of required notifications for that particular entity in that state. So when it comes to you as the investor looking at an LLC, an operating agreement might be part of the documentation that would be provided in order to show you as an investor into the company. Now, this can be done in a few different ways. And again, I'm trying to bring this out there to help people understand what might be kind of typical in a certain scenario with any given type of investment. Now, some of these are more formalized because they do have some uh, you know, federal oversight from different types of laws and, and governing bodies. But in the general realm of private equities, on the smaller end of this, there is very little oversight when it comes to, you know, government agencies stepping in and saying, hey, these are required documents for this type of investment. Uh, now, when it comes to an IRA, you're not going to do a handshake deal. But, you know, if you are out there looking to invest personal capital, yes, you certainly could have some type of handshake deal with someone uh, with this particular you know, company, if you will, and and go forward from there. But let's say you're operating in the realm of wanting a little bit more documentation and wanting to be a little bit more forward with regard to making sure that everything is uh, signed, dotted, and delivered correctly. Well, if you're investing into an LLC, they might bring you on as a member equity shareholder into that LLC by utilizing a exhibit to the operating agreement. Typically, this will be done on something like called like an exhibit A or a schedule A of the operating agreement, where maybe if it's a newly formed entity for a new type of investment, and we see this a lot in different types of real estate uh, real estate LLCs is that you would then in turn be listed as a member and your certain share percentage of the whole entity and also the amount of uh, you know the, the amount of shares that you receive and the amount of capital that you invest along with your other members and shareholders would be listed on that type of um, uh, let's call it an adjunct or addition to the operating agreement now especially if you're doing this with an IRA or retirement plan, that's again where you would see that listed. So if you are looking at uh, Jane Smith's LLC that's being set up new for a new real estate purchase, which is what we see a lot of with the more um, with, with the smaller end LLCs with fewer members that are just kind of special purpose, you might see that where essentially it's the operating agreement from the beginning is going to just list everyone as the shareholders. And in that case, if you're using a retirement plan, such as an IRA, that's where your IRA would be listed. Now, that's not to say that you can't invest into an LLC after the fact. Now, if you did and all the members are initially listed on that operating agreement and you want to come in afterwards, well, what does that look like with an LLC? Well, it could be done in a few different ways. It could be structured as a sale of new membership. So they could create new membership units in the LLC to sell you or your IRA. And in that case, it would simply dilute the amount of shares that everyone else holds because there's newly issued shares and the ratio of, of ownership effectively would be affected. Uh, or some other member could sell you their membership units or shares in that entity. Now, that's important to understand because if there is an issuance of new shares at a later date or some type of sale of other shares, it might be a good idea to ask the person that is, uh, you know, trying to put together this investment or the, that you're investing with to see the portion of the operating agreement that details the inclusion of new members or the issuance of new membership units to make sure what you're buying is actually able to be sold or generated because operating agreements can restrict the ability of the entity itself to issue new shares, raise more capital. So again, although it's not necessarily something that you can look up in public record as easy as, let's say, uh, looking up the owner of a property on a deed or looking up corporate filings and, and registrations in a particular state, making sure that the investment provider, in this case, the smaller LLC, 
is able and authorized to issue these new shares or take on new investors is very important to make sure that you have a valid and enforceable agreement with this particular entity or business to actually hold that type of uh, <clears throat> hold that type of investment. So again, that's just some things that I've kind of seen in my professional career that I would encourage people to look for. And again, when it comes to doing due diligence, this is simply just kind of scratching the surface and a very high level of what you maybe want to ask for and look for when it comes to investing. Because this is definitely a spectrum. When it comes to investing into an LLC, you know, this is definitely more on the end of very few members, maybe a very early stage company that's looking to raise capital or someone may be investing into a piece of real estate with that initial LLC and needs a, needs some more money uh, to finish a project. Or maybe they are developing a new product and they are more of the, you know, kind of startup company phase. It's always good to understand and make sure that you have the ability to acquire and actually own, uh, you know, what you're looking to go out and purchase. So that would be the acquisition of new equity equity or new membership units in that LLC. Now, that's not to say that there aren't other ways to invest in LLCs. They could uh, bring you on as debt. It could be something like a debenture note, where it's basically an unsecured note, or it's a, a note secured by the shares of the underlying LLC. So the repayment could be made in equity of the LLC. It could be something like a convertible note, which we'll get into how that plays into other types of entities where it's a little bit more common, but essentially lending them money where it could be uh, the repayment could be could be defined in that operating sorry in that agreement as repayment in shares or cap or actual US dollars cash at a later date. So those are kind of you know, a few different ways that you can look at investing into LLCs in the private equity realm. And also you could definitely lend them money as well. That's certainly a way to go. And especially as it pertains to what we were talking about in our last podcast of unrelated debt finance tax and uh, unrelated business income tax, if these entities are operating as, let's say, an active trader business or there's underlying debt to, let's say, a piece of real estate or something, and you want to avoid an equity ownership in a pass-through uh, LLC, then doing some type of debt agreement with them might definitely be a favorable tax position for you to be in. Again, check with tax and legal counsel as to which is the best way to go. But just understanding, just because it may be attractive to own a piece of the underlying uh, entity because of the big, the large potential upside if there is a large amount of revenues generated, or let's say the product that they're trying to develop gets acquired, bought out, or again, there's some type of large liquidity event or buyout that would generate a lot of revenue for you, depending on the taxation of some of those things, especially if you're looking at it with the with the lens of a retirement plan, utilizing debt where you lend them money in some form or fashion might definitely be something for you to look at. So just keep that in mind. So that kind of covers LLCs in a large general sense. There's membership units, there's the ability to issue them debt, uh, there's the different types of documentation that you maybe want to look for, especially when it comes to the smaller ones of making sure that the people you're talking to are able to actually act on behalf of the LLC. So getting things like articles of organization, making sure they have a valid tax ID number. Uh, if you are going to be investing in direct equity, making sure that they can provide you some type of documentation as to the issuance of that additional equity or getting a copy of the operating agreement if you're coming in from the very beginning are all very good things to look for when it comes to investing in private equity, when it comes to LLCs. Now let's transition into trusts. So trusts are a very old type of uh, legal entity where uh, the assets of a certain group of people or persons are separated from them personally and put into an entity, this being a trust that is directed by a trustee, of someone acting in a fiduciary capacity for that uh, entity, if you will. Now, I won't get into the minutia of exactly what really defines the difference between trusts and LLCs, but suffice it to say they are different. And there are many different reasons as to why someone might form an investment trust that they are 
directing uh, and maybe he's trying to solicit capital for versus an LLC or a corporation or a limited partnership. But just understand if that if someone approaches you or you are out there looking for an investment to make and you run across someone that is utilizing a trust, uh, you know, it's not necessarily anything wrong or bad about it. But again, just like with anything in the investment realm, it has its own set of uh, things that need to be looked at that you might want to be concerned with and also making sure that you're doing your own due diligence to make sure that documentation is in good order and properly provided to you in order to make an informed decision. So with a trust, there's a lot less documentation on the entity side of things than there would be from something like, let's say, a corporation, a limited partnership, <clears throat> or an LLC. Basically, you have a trust document, which is going to, at bare minimum, tell you a few things. One, who the pe person, persons, or entities are that added in the capital or assets into that, into that trust. They are going to be called the grantor. It's going to detail who the trustee is. And the most analogous thing I can say for the trustee is that they're the manager. They're the ones that direct all the actions of the trustee. Sorry, the trustee directs all the actions of the trust. They make sure that everything's operating. They sign documents. They're the manager. They're the CEO of that trust, if you will. And then there's going to be the beneficiaries, which is where typically you would come in as an investor to become a beneficiary of a trust or a grantor and beneficiary. Now, there's a ton of different ways to structure trust, um, but most commonly grantor beneficiary, personal property, and a few other types of trusts are the most commonly used. So you would add money into the trust as a grantor, and then you would be listed as someone that would receive a portional benefit to the amount of capital you added in. Again, very similar to being a member of an LLC, uh, but again, the legal structuring is a little bit different. Now, in that scenario, you would need a copy of the trust document. This is one thing that, again, would need to be provided to you to make sure that this investment is viable and you can check to make sure that the trustee is properly listed, that the person that you're dealing with is acting in good faith and able to operate on behalf of that trust. Now, certainly not as common uh, in the smaller end private realm. There are large, what are called real estate investment trusts or REITs, uh, which again, offer the opportunity for people to buy into large real estate portfolio holdings at a much smaller dollar figure than buying real estate directly. They have their place, but the issues with those types of you know, hybrid private equities that they're highly illiquid. And that's another thing to look for with all private equities is the liquidity or the ability to sell, trade, or convey these types of assets. Because a lot of the time, you know, I'd say probably three quarters of the time, you're going to have some type of restriction on being able to sell these types of investments. You're either going to have to wait for some type of liquidity event. So the underlying investments of these entities sells, the entities are acquired, or unfortunately, if the asset goes to, you know, zero value, then, you know, you would have to write it off. But <clears throat> it's important to know that a lot of these types of investments can be very illiquid, meaning that if you invest in them, uh, unlike a piece of real estate or a gold coin or you know a publicly traded stock where if you need capital and you can just say, okay, you know what, I'd like to sell it at this point. That's not the case with a lot of private equities. It's something that you're going to have to have a very uh, pragmatic approach as to how much you need this capital and look at what the expected return timelines are for this particular type of investment. Now, some of them are a little bit more well-defined and we'll get to that in limited partnerships, but especially with trusts, LLCs, and uh, certain types of corporations, uh, you know, there's a definite um, unknown for how long the capital might be deployed for. So just keep that in mind. So getting back to trusts, again, you have the grantors, which are the people that add in the capital to the trust. You have the beneficiaries or the people who receive the benefit from the trust. And then you have the trustee who is the, you know, think about like them as the manager or, uh, you know, managing member or primary <clears throat> director of the actions of that trust. That is what you're looking at uh, for trust. Now, again, I won't stay too long on trust because they're certainly not as common when it comes to uh, private equities in general, but it's important to understand that they're out there and I didn't want to miss it. Now, coming to the more prevalent type of, of private equity that's out there, the two last that we're going to kind of cover are limited partnerships and trust. Now, limited partnerships are kind of a similar... They have a lot of similarities to both uh, corporations and also to LLCs. Now, 
Limited partnerships are popular for the reason that they offer the ability for investors to remain in a passive position, but have a much larger reach and easily scalable structure than an LLC might. Because with an LLC, you might get into the aspect of having to, you know, depending on how they're issuing the actual membership out, might be in a more active position where you would like to be in a more passive position or vice versa. Limited partnerships offer the ability to bifurcate the type of equity investment that the investor would be making between two different pools. One being the limited partners, which are, again, think about them as like the silent partners in a particular offering, or they could be... Um, uh, managing partners, which would be the more active, uh, you know, day-to-day -day, um, managerial aspects of the particular um, investment structure. So with limited partnerships, these are going to be very popular for a lot of different types of popular investment structures. One, real estate syndications. If you hear kind of the buzzwords about people talking about, oh, I'm investing into this real estate syndication or this commercial real estate venture, uh, Dollars to donuts, typically they're going to be structured as a limited partnership. And again, I won't get too far into the weeds of why they necessarily want to do it in a certain particular form or fashion. Just understand that that's typically how those things are going to work. Now, when it comes to investing in things such as real estate syndications, uh, there are some things that are going to be a little bit more formalized when it comes to these because typically they're looking to raise millions of dollars instead of maybe 10,000 or you know 50 or 100,000, which certainly are not small sums of money. But when you talk about raising millions of dollars, the stakes get higher, the regulations get tighter. And again, it's important to understand uh, you know, where these kind of things flesh out. So with limited partnerships, typically, they're going to be regulated under either Reg D or Reg A of the JOBS Act, which is the large portion of legislation that was passed under the Obama administration, which opened up the ability for people to solicit investors a little bit easier um, for private equity investments. Now, there are some certain regulations that, again, surround that, which one uh, can maybe, maybe close off the ability to invest in certain types of projects to certain people that don't meet, again, certain criteria, and also to benefit, also formalize the investment structure of some of these things. So whereas we're talking about trust and LLCs, there might be a wide variety of different things that are provided with limited partnerships, especially in the realm of people that are doing this on a larger scale, there's a little bit more government regulation that has to be abided by. Granted, they're not necessarily regulated to the effect that someone like uh, FINRA or the SEC would on publicly traded companies, but there is a little bit more of a formalized documentation that goes into these types of investment offerings. So with a limited partnership, if you are going to pursue this type of investment or you hear about one, the documents that you can expect to see are one going to be what's called a subscription agreement. This is going to detail a lot of the <coughs> fine, fine print of who you are as the investor of acquiring the limited partnership interest, how much, what the unit price is, uh, you know, verifying personal information. If it is an accredited investor investment, verifying that you are indeed qualified or the entity you're using to invest, such as an IRA or other, is qualified to make the investment. So that's basically kind of like the investor form packet. And then additionally, you're going to be provided with what's called a prospectus and a PPM or private placement memorandum. Now, these are going to be significantly longer documents than the subscription agreement. Subscription agreements can range anywhere from about uh, nine to 10 pages to maybe 25 to 30. Now, PPMs and... <clears throat> So the private placement memorandum or PPM and prospectus, those are typically going to be on the order of 75 to 200 pages because those are what are regulated under the JOBS Act and Reg D and Reg A of that subsequent uh, legislation to detail a lot of things such as the time horizon for the investment, what the expected rate of returns are, what the market risks are, analysis, all sorts of good stuff that can help you as the investor make a more informed decision on what is going on. But with that additional regulation, again, comes some 
uh, restrictions on certain types of investors. But those are kind of the three big pieces that you're going to need to look at as far as just a paperwork perspective of investing in a limited partnership are going to be the, the private placement memorandum, the prospectus, and also the subscription agreement. Now, they might have some other documents that they provide. But in general, again, nine times out of 10, if you're looking at investing in one of these types of investment structures, that's what you're going to be looking at as far as documentation that would be provided. And it's going to provide you a lot of great information. Now, with these, especially in the context of what we talked about last time with unrelated debt finance income tax and things like that, because a lot of times when you scale to this size, you're going to have debt associated with the underlying investment. But these do allow you to remain in a passive position and avoid that actor trade of business income that's a lot harder to avoid with the UBIT taxes, especially if you're using an IRA. But... <clears throat> In this context, again, limited partnerships are great. Once you start getting into larger projects, it's what a lot of these different types of um, investment providers will utilize, especially in the commercial real estate realm. Now, I did mention there are some restrictions on being able to invest in these, especially if you are not what's called an accredited investor. So what is an accredited investor? An accredited investor is an individual or business entity that is allowed to trade securities that might not be registered with financial authorities, such as the SEC or FINRA. These entities are <clears throat> entitled to this privileged access by satisfying at least one requirement regarding their income, net worth, asset size, uh, government status, or professional experience. So to become an accredited investor, um, you must have a yearly income of over 200000 or 300000 with a spouse or domestic partner. Uh, you also have to have, um, you could have a net worth over a million dollars, not exceeding, or sorry, not including the value of your primary residence. And again, there's that kind of thing, making sure you have enough uh, capital or income or net worth to afford you the opportunity to have to invest in something that can be inherently very risky and to lose the underlying capital. So they want to make sure that they're not making people uh, that maybe are just, you know, they only have $200,000 of available retirement funds or they're only worth $300,000, uh, making sure that they're not put in the poor house, you know, by investing in something that could be very risky uh, by one, not understanding the risk and not having the capital to absorb a potential uh, downfall of their underlying investment. So that's what an accredited investor is. And when you start getting into larger offerings such as uh, private stock offerings or limited partnership offerings or solicited investments, you're going to hear that term thrown around. So that's what a limit. So, so that's what a, a accredited investor is. So just understand that if uh, you know you don't meet those requirements, you may not necessarily be able to invest in every private equity offering that you run across. And lastly, let's cover corporations. Everyone's heard of corporations, but essentially what a corporation is, it can be many different things. An LLC could be a corporation. Um, you know, just be it's kind of more of a, a tax and operational status election for a particular business. But if someone is electing to tax their business as a corp or structure it as a C Corp, then it might open up additional opportunities for offerings to be made. And so whereas with a <laughs> and especially in a passive scenario, which is, again, it's very important if you're an IRA investor or retirement plan investor uh, to make sure you stay on the passive side of things. Or even if it is uh, shares of an active trader business, being able to shield yourself from that UBIT tax like we talked about last time by utilizing a C-Corp. And corporations, again, can have stock offerings in various different scenarios. It could be things like a initial offering, such as a Series A, a subsequent dilution offering, um, you know, at a different valuation or funding round, so like a Series B or C. So again, things to look at when it comes to you know investing in corporations, again, corporations don't have to be publicly traded, but most of the time it's going to be fairly analogous when you look at the types of requirements and documentation for a limited partnership offering and a private stock offering from a corporation. Uh, while you may not necessarily have a um, you know a subscription to limited partnership interest, you're definitely still going to have a uh, prospectus, a private placement memorandum, a subscription agreement uh, are all typically going to be included in, in included in and provided to you 
when investing in private stock that is structured as a corporation as opposed to a limited partnership. So <clears throat> those are kind of, again, the four main basic private equities that are going to be out there. And there's a bunch of different ones. There's private hedge funds. There's private equity investment companies. There's a lot of different, you know, veins to look at, but most often, more often than not, when it comes to you as the investor or an IRA investor going out there and just looking at the general private equities that might be available to you, it's either going to be an LLC, a trust, a limited partnership, or some type of uh, corporate share offering. And again, corporate share offerings can be things like private bank stock, it can be startup companies, it can be uh, existing long-term private investment companies. There's a lot of different ways to frame this. But, uh, but again, what I mainly wanted to bring to people's attention and kind of educate you on today are kind of what the documentation is related to a lot of these different types of investments, what things that you kind of maybe need to look for so you make sure that you're understanding and asking the right questions and saying, hey, you know, was I provided this? Um, you know, do, do I under, you know, do I understand what really goes into this? And that's what, again, I like to make sure people understand, especially when it comes to investing in new things is, you know, what goes into this? Uh, because there's a lot of due diligence that needs to be done on this, because the big thing that I want to kind of uh, end on are some potential issues in, with these types of investments. Um, one, you know, as we kind of covered last time, is the potential for some exotic taxes, especially for using an IRA uh, with different with with these different types of investments. So if you're in an active trader business or there's underlying debt uh, and you're not using something like a solo 401k um, and they're not structuring as a C-Corp, you might have some of these different types of taxes that might apply. Additionally, these are going to inherently be riskier ventures than a lot of other things. Now, not to say that they all inherently are going to be on the cutting edge of risk and they are going to be insanely risky no matter what they're doing, depending on what the project is. If someone's putting together a you know, an LLC with a couple members and they need capital to go out and buy a rental property cash, you know, again, your risk tolerance is going to vary for everyone, but that could potentially be a less risky investment than someone that's going out and uh, developing a Bitcoin um, investment algorithm. Again, these are going to inherently be riskier because there's less regulation and oversight into these types of investments than you would have with a publicly traded company. But those any investment is going to inherently have risk. But generally speaking, and it's generally accepted that private equity investments are going to have a higher degree of risk than, than almost you know any other type of investment out there. But again, it's a spectrum. Risk is definitely on that spectrum as well. So just understand that these can definitely be uh, much riskier ventures. Now, depending on how you're investing in these, um, it might be harder for you to write off losses, depending on if you're using an IRA to invest in these types of things. You don't typically get you don't get to write off IRA losses personally. So especially if you're an IRA investor into private equities, making sure that you really understand that risk tolerance because there really isn't an ability to recapture uh, any type of lost revenues or lost capital that you have with personal tax filings as you might if you personally invested or invested through an entity you own or control. So again, the the risk of investing in these types of of these types of structures is <clears throat> something that is, needs to be very apparent to people doing this and at the forefront of what you're looking at doing. So again, those are some of the potential issues that you know people need to look at. One, risk. Two, documentation. Three, understanding who you're investing with, uh, especially when you're investing in the private realm, really making sure that you understand what you're investing in, you trust whom you're investing with, and you've done your research on who you're investing with as well. We have plenty of different episodes of this podcast, and we did several great ones um, specifically focused on how to do due diligence on private investments, especially limited partnerships and real estate syndication. So I'd encourage you to go back and check out a few of those if you're interested in learning more on how to do due diligence, because again, that is a very big component of investing in this function is making sure you do a lot of good due diligence before investing into private equities. So with that said, that's where I want to end it off today, giving people kind of a good overview and introduction to what investing with private equities looks like, um, you know, what different types of offerings are out there, what you can expect from different documentation from all these different types, uh, what some of the inherent drawbacks to these things are, um, such as, you know, be them being highly illiquid. I'm just maybe making, making the introduction to this new vein of alternative investing for people. So with that said, again, my name's Alex Perney. Thank you very much for joining with us today. I hope you learned something about private equity investing and have a great day.
Tune in next week for more investing tips and strategies. Want to hear more episodes of The Alternative Investing Advantage? Search podcast at advantaira.com and subscribe.